Welcome. This is the September 26 Beehive Production user call. We have Daniel, Matthias, Chris, Hans, John, Santi, and myself, Michael. And let's see, Chris, you had started on the fact that one, all documentation seems to relate to bridges, and you're not wrong. And a lot of the Beehive automation tools are tied to bridges. What, what prompted that? Yeah, so um, I got this email from, he's, he's called Seth Hoffert, and um, he was uh, basically stating that he, he likes VM State D because um, that kind of allows uh, him to keep using uh, NetGraph uh, in combination with Beehive. And I realized that, um, as we already wrote here, that most of the document, I mean, any documentation that I've seen so far with Beehive really is focused on using bridges and then just kind of stops there as if there isn't anything else. Mm -hmm. Not wrong. And <laughs> I basically realized, okay, I should probably put that on my to-do list. So we, um, you know, update the, the handbook mm -hmm. on that as well. And that basically drove me back to the question, okay, um, what kind of documentation is actually there on that graph? And, Seth was actually very kind. He he came back with a, an elaborate email describing various things that can be done. And he pointed me to, uh, I think he even pointed out, um, if I'm not mistaken, because, or maybe I Googled that, there's also a reasonably good um, uh, <clears throat> tutorial uh, by Clara. But um, then it's already kind of getting in, let's say, in the documentation department. So I wanted to ask you guys whether you have any materials, sites that you can recommend on how to, you know, learn more about it. I have an approach. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Daniel. You read my mind. So I, my, uh, my fleet's all net graph um, for, and I have jail and VM posts. Um, so, and I, I ran into the same issue where the different managers you know, there there were there were none that were really super agnostic to how networks were set up. So I, I just wrote basically I used Clara's original um, documentation and expanded on it. And with the help of a bunch of people on the call, I came up with a, a sort of a, you know, just a RC, a, an RCD script that um, that helps you configure uh, VM Beehive and, and jail. Um, but it is it is generic enough that you can pr pretty much use it for anything. Um, and you can, you know, you you can configure from the, the interface, you can configure with just a couple lines in RC, RCD and, um, you know, uh, and it does, it'll help you with Mac tracking for jails and, uh, and, and stuff like that. But I kept it really, really super simple with just basic, basic SH. So, um, it could it could use a little a few more comments, but but it provides, uh, you know, I think almost all of the operations that you would need to do. So so the code itself, it's just one you know just one uh, born uh, RC script, and you can you can dig out um, anything that you would need to to write tooling around around your system. Um, there's a jail manager called Jailer that that might ingest this, um, and there's there's a few features that I want to add to it, um, just for for various cases like not using VM Beehive. Um, it has it has some extra magic for VM Beehive to name the NetGraph interfaces, which is really useful for actually creating the maps from NetGraph. Um, but I, I'd like to make it a little more even more agnostic and more flexible. Um, but I think I think that that yeah that thing that I wrote I think is a pretty useful uh, place to you know it's it's self documented enough that I, I think that it can give a lot of hints for how to do it um, and there's there's one caveat that I think was figured out um, that there's there's some sys control tunings that need to be done to make NetGraph a little better. Um, that, that people discovered on one of these calls. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be, I'll try to add some of those, some more notes to the, to the code there. And that's just service. I mean, it's, it should just be package install ng buddy. It's in the, it's in the FreeBSD repo, but, um, but it's, it's due for an update. 
uh, in the next month or so. Did you say that worked with Jailer or what, or a different one? Make it, make it, Jail. It is in it is in Jailer, but I don't I don't know if okay. Jailer's quite. I mean, I don't think that's in ports yet, and I don't know no. if it's ready for production. Um, mm, it's been like your tools. It's been used in production by a company, but it's making slowly make its way out to the outside world. Right. There's still there's still a little magic you have to know to get Jailer working. But I'm mm. I'm very I'm I'm interested in it because it's like like the MB Hive. It has a um it's a jail manager that's that's sort of ZFS first. Um mm. which which I'm attracted to. Um there it is. But uh yeah, this is this is nice. And I think I got it, I think I got the RC order pretty good. So you can configure if you want to do private netgraph interfaces, you can configure them with just IF config underscore uh you know netgraph uh interface name and it does it does boot and things things are consistent i think this is on um about 35 hosts um with with several hundred jails and vms so in 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 my production and then you know it's used in jailer and some other things so hopefully th that'll give you some uh hints on how to how to soup up uh how to you know net graphify any any other tools you want because i've i've obviously been through a lot of ups and downs and edge cases and stuff like that so i i'd be i'd love to see net graph get out there more because it it's so so nice i love the you know uh the stats and the the graphing and and it, it does seem to perform a little better um that's what I wanted to ask, actually, whether you have any idea uh, in, in contrast, you know, in comparison to what uh, AF Bridge delivers. Uh, I read a lot about um, NetGraph bringing better performance, uh, particularly when you um, when you look at the throughput, let's say, in the bandwidth. And um, and yeah. um, I, I actually, th actually, this is kind of also segue probably into <laughs> because I also wanted to mention that um, all the stuff that I did for your BSD con, I I put up on GitHub, and um, there's there's a lot of stuff in there where Beehive is getting jailed, and there's multiple levels of bridges that interact with that. And I figure NetGraph would probably help you know speed things up um, because one of the questions that the participants also had was how that is going to impact performance, and obviously there is going to be an impact. I mean, it's the more stuff you, you know st stack on top of each other. You need to expect that there's some slowdowns. Um, so um, I, I would be curious if, if if you had a closer look on that. So now I, I think that I think the problem with my benchmarking. So I have seen a pretty pretty significant performance increase. Um, the only thing the only thing better, of course, is you know not using bridging at all and not using virtual interfaces at all, but. Um, but I saw I saw a pretty good uh, performance. There is some question about whether, uh, you know, about where where certain locking occurs for the. I, I mean, I, this this is I I don't know anything about kernels really. So, but but there is supposedly some, you know, limit with large numbers of of VMs that you'll get diminishing returns on the performance increases for uh, for, for NetGraph. Now this. Now I've also heard from other, you know, other experts that you know if some of your instances are VNet, then then you know then VNet would would then reduce those those limits because you'd have another virtual uh, interface and there there wouldn't be sort of competition in the. I mean I, I forget I I'm sorry I forget what it is specifically but basically what I'm saying is my benchmarks showed a pretty significant increase along the lines of what uh, what's in that Clara article. But I've heard uh, debate about <clears throat> whether there are kernel limits on, at scale. So that's that's something that I have not um, that I haven't experimented with. All right, can I can I um, can I do a, a follow up question on the bridges really quick? Um, during during my session at EuroVSDCon, I mentioned that um, sort of the best practice is to put the IP address on a bridge instead of the member interface or the let's say the physical member interface. 
And I could explain it in terms of IPv6 because I think it's reasonably straightforward why it makes sense or why you actually have to have uh, the IP address um, on on the bridge instead of the physical member. But um, in terms of IPv4, I could swear I read somewhere that it's also supposed to go on the bridge, but I I, I couldn't I couldn't remember where I read that and where where it's documented. It or maybe I'm maybe I'm imagining things. I I don't know. Um, can you guys help me out with this? Um, is there any kind of particular reason that actually backs the argument that um, that if you have multiple, basically, uh, virtual and a physical uh, interface on a bridge, that the physical address should actually also go on the bridge? Sorry, I was just going to quickly say that that with the if you use the ng underscore bridge object you can't put an ip on it so all right okay. oh really okay <laughs> so that's so there i think is there is a bridge there is a i think there is a bridge interface object i haven't experimented with, with that though um but uh but i mean in in terms of net graph, i i do i i agree i agree with you otherwise that i've i've always heard that the interface, the IP is supposed to go on that. And I thought that, but I thought that was for firewalling specific, specifically, that that was a, that was a firewalling concern and where to put the, you know, where to put the pass and block rules for PF or IPFW. But um, yeah, I, I could be mistaken with that. Um, uh, but yeah, you might be right, because I think generally, unless you enable it, I think you... Does PF because that that also came up during the session whether whether you have uh, filtering enabled on um, on each of the members of a bridge and I told I told basically everyone to <laughs> avoid that if if possible because it's just the world of pain. I have um, one yeah I have one client that has a has a bridge bridge device uh, a, you know an, an IF bridge device with public <laughs> with all the boxes on public IPs and 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 PF filtering on that so it's on a verizon it's on a verizon wan and then yeah and then filtering goes through the bridge and then it's i don't know it's it's a mess and i'm sure it's not and i'm sure it's not efficient either um yeah so it's yeah i i don't know but uh um michael may i jump in here really quickly it's not just the beehive scripts that are online it's basically also the mail server is also in oh. there Great. Okay, um, cool. And 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 the scripts for the mail server are probably overkill because they create a lab where you get a DNS server and two mail servers and the client computer where each mail server can send to the other mail server and you can try stuff out with the client. So you get um, everything in, you know, compressed form into uh, into your virtual lab environment, including the whole thing based on jail beehive basically and uh okay so i took that time i'll fix this first as you requested jailing beehive slash mail server okay um that all said i found the link to jan's explanation after we've brought this up about a thousand times on these calls so let's take a look and I he's not it. here to Set us straight, but he's done it many a time. Let's see if this loads. Come on, redirecting. Go redirect. Is his VMs out? You got to bring it up on archive.org. Oh, um, no. Yeah. Really? You, okay. You I yelled at him about it on Tuesday. We're, okay. Maybe that's why he can't attend. He's futzing with his VMs uh, offline. All okay. those all those arguments, all those discussions we've had about Bardish and he. Yeah. <laughs> Box is down for days. That doesn't even make any sense. Uh oh. Wait. Find an algorithm blip. Here we go. We can do this. Oh, I will have to click again. 10 o'clock and 50 seconds. Come on. Come on, archive.org. Oh, thank you. I don't want to make a donation during the call. <laughs> The correct way to configure bridges in FreeBSD for V6 and V4, August 1st. So there you have it. Um, I will drop, I suppose, the archive.org. Oh, you beat me to it. Thank you. Good, good work. Um, 
So, Chris, your answer lies in here. And <laughs> something Perfect. about Thank scoping. you. Let's see. You know, IPv6 scoping, I recall, being one of the things. So let's not rehash that for the 50th time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, 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 version. Okay. So other topics. And thank you for being so diligent on getting all the goodies up there. I'm sorry, I so couldn't you attend can, your you tutorial. can create a tap. Can you hear me? Yep. You can create a tap device and attach that to the bridge for your local host if you want. The most people would put it. Most people these days will put it on the bridge, but you do, you're right. We don't want to put it on the physical device. Yeah, I was going to say from a networking point of view, you never put a, an IP address on a physical device, especially if that device goes down. Yeah, so it, it doesn't matter which device if it's. BSD, Beehive, or whatever, you never put the IP addresses on a bridge on a physical, attached to a physical. So I think that's that's one of the points. You can still do it, and I remember in Beehive, most of the connectivity will work, uh, but then if you were trying to ping some local VMs, it will fail to resolve. Um, I think that, that was the main issue. Um, but yeah, in general, it's a bad idea. I think you just resolved uh, a technical glitch that I've been looking into on my own land uh, for for some while. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, you've come <laughs> to the right you. place. Uh, yeah, okay, that's great. I need to follow up on that later. Okay, so VMs could not talk to one another or to the host or vice versa? Sometimes to the host, you were not able to ping, like, if you have a service on the host or whatever you want to SSH, it was not resolving MAC addresses, and then that's it. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. But again, that, that was a long time ago, yeah, like two, three years. Yeah, well, yep. Ah, okay. Moving on. Not the right article, though. Okay, other topics and questions. Um, highlights from uh, Eurobased Econ. I have two questions or yes, three. Yes, please. Santi, let her rip. First, if you can tell me something about the IOM MMU that I lost that that presentation from Kid, <laughs> when it's going to be available for AMD. Yeah. Did he mention anything? During the Dev Summit, it was there is one more bug he is tackling, according to Ed Mast. Okay. I have no details. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, then, are you aware of any regression on fourteen dot one p five in terms of PCI path through? Um, I'm asking this because I was doing some PCI path through last week on three servers on Intel, not AMD, Intel, uh, with different cars, Mellanox and, and Intel's. No problems. And then after upgrading to p five. Um, I get an assertion on on the var. Um, I can't remember, but it complains when you start the VM, it crashes automatically. It says, hey, assertion oh. fail equals zero on line 695. I can't remember exactly, but I, uh, so I can I provide believe, more info. I'm, I'm, I'm going by memory on this one, but I believe I saw some commits go by that modified the way that um, some of the bar accesses work. You might want to uh, get clone a, an older, slightly older rev, and uh, uh, test it and do a do a do a test to see if that commit fix it fixed it slash broke it. Okay, yeah, sounds like I, I went back to P one <coughs> and, and it was working, but yeah. Um, can you can you post that assertion somewhere so that I can take a look? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, let me try now, and I will paste it into the comments. Into the yeah. chat. So uh, I like... noticed a problem with PCI pass through on FreeBSD recently. Um, not that the VM would crash, but um, pass through would seemingly work in this case of an Intel uh, MIG. And um, the guest in that case, NetBeast, would attach its driver and everything would look normal. It's just not passing packets um, to the wire and not receiving any. Okay. Um, which is, I found interesting because the exact same VM on the exact same hardware would work on smarter with no problem. Okay. 
I mean, it, it was working properly, and then it's just the VM cannot even boot, so it starts and uh, and stops yeah. automatically. What if we looked at uh, GPU pass through and uh, this kind of stuff um, when it's, when it's going around mapping and unmapping bars and sometimes mapping an option or anything mm. that still well can cause issues. So it, it would help to see the. Um, yeah, this, for this, sure. The output, see, yeah. Which part exactly breaks? Yeah, let, um, me, let me find that. If you're on IRC, you can just post it in the channel. It's easier for me to read. <laughs> Sorry, what? Uh, well, if on if IRC? you're on IRC channel for BI. For... Okay, I can join. But then, then don't bother. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I will join, I will join, yeah. It's easier to communicate like, over there. Yeah. Um, speaking about password, does anyone know whether there is a um, a document written somewhere that explains how the GPU pass through and in particular Intel GPU pass through is supposed to work and how it's supposed to be configured? Oh, the That's number one source is Corvin's talk, and hmm. I have been basing my things off of that. I've not been succeeding, and it's it's yeah, unpredictable. Precisely the point. I've been trying uh, stuff based on his talk. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, posts on Reddit and everywhere, and I could not get it to work with the Intel hardware that I have here. What generation uh, do you have? Um, I think it's generation eleven. That might that's be a what... problem. It's apparently, uh, yeah. I will make a point of sending you what I have. Yeah. Um, he, he, <laughs> for each event, I've asked him to try and hook me up with getting it working on, and pref on a preferred system that should be the right generation and pretty similar to what he has, but I just couldn't get it to work. So yeah, I, let's have that conversation. Yeah, it's missing, so. I was uh, looking at the stuff and looking at what the firmware is doing, and <laughs> I don't know, it didn't really look all that functional. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, even if I if I can't get it um, to work um, with whatever guest OS I'm choosing, I kind of expected it to do something if I give it the right firmware for a boot room or an option room. And even that, just not doing anything. You are not wrong. Okay, good to know. No, I spent quite a bit of time with that, and I do consider it a holy grail topic to pursue. So it's a bit frustrating. Uh, thank you, Santi, for publish, for posting the assertion. Yeah, that that assertion just means that. Um, well, it doesn't tell us what exactly went wrong, but in this function, it's. Um, Basically, setting up a mapping with the tell, telling the the kernel module to map the bar into memory or into guest memory or uh, unmap it from guest memory, and if that fails, you will run into that assertion. So there were a bunch of recent like errata from some third party that found vulnerabilities. I wonder if they stepped on yeah. pass through mm. in the process. Yeah. I don't find that assertion uh, to be particularly yeah. helpful, and I have a patch that makes it a bit more useful, but yeah. Okay. Um, so I have seen that when I was experimenting with PCI option ROMs, and um, they couldn't be mapped because something was already at that address that they wanted to map it. Uh, okay. Um, interesting so the, the question would be what was the guest doing what was it trying to do at the, that time probably running inside some driver the driver doing stuff like mapping a bar or changing a bar configuration does that happen in a, in a guest kernel or is that already in a, in a guest uh, firmware so that would be the UEFI boot room um, well, this one is not using UF5. It's using the deprecated CSM EDK2. So, 
still UEFI too, but <laughs> yeah, it has payload. Yes, yeah. Um, so in, is that the firmware or does the the guest kernel load at the time already? And so it's... it doesn't show anything. It's just uh, when I do the dehive command, it, I, it just crashes okay. immediately. It's it's I like one second and it dies. That looks like it's doing something in the firmware and confusing um, the bar mappings. I mean, is it? Is it? I mean, it looks like it's trying to use modifiable bar, which do we support? Um, yes. <laughs> well, it's 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 a bit the, the thing with those bars is of course you can um change the addresses and if uh, Beehive itself the user space part ignores that, um, then yes, it's not modifiable. But I think especially with regard to the whole GPU pass through thing. Uh, yes, Beehive does support uh, modifiable mm -hmm. bar, and um, uh, I, I think it's, we, it's, there's a lot we, when, when I meant it with the VGA ROMs and um, most recently with the uh, GPU pass through stuff. It was this one specifically. If I go back, back to P1 before I think they changed the code, I was checking it just works, um, and that's why I was surprised. I was using it last week, uh, and then. There was an upgrade, of course, due to the security vulnerabilities on Beehive, and then yeah, it stops working. So maybe I will open a PR. Um, One option is always to just perfect the changes. So, See, so, sorry, can you repeat that? Well, one thing that you can do if you if you build your own free BSD, then you can bisect, you skip mm, bisect, yeah. change that broke it. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for that one. John, any, I don't know, LibNFS news or other cool things? Well, I got a couple of questions regarding the software TPM backend. Oh, Hans, yes. Okay, sure. I got three commits out for review. And most of them got an okay from Corbin uh, and not much else. So my question would be, how do they actually end up in FreeBSC? How do they get committed? What do I need to do? Who else wants to review them or needs to review them? And who can integrate them? That it, those are valid questions. Um, if it if they pass the the happiness test of say the beehive group and say john as a maintainer and corvin who seems to have a distinct you know interest in it corvin should be able to commit it for you on your behalf <laughs> um it's not always a super scientific process uh john and or daniel have you wanted to do you want to talk about some experiences on your parts of getting things in Were you asking me? Oh, that yeah, you're one possibility who's gotten some things in over the years. Uh, eh. I, I I used to I I was a I'm an ex committer, and even then, you would get disagreement with your with your commit. I tended to get a lot of uh, you're scratching your own itch, um, which kind of leads to me basically I maintain my own repos with my own uh, patches and. <laughs> Um, it's kind of sad because some of this I think would be kind of nice out, you know, in public. Um, I think there's a lack of resources. It really, really helps if you can find someone who is actually actively maintaining the code and who has an interest in what you're looking at. Um, otherwise, you really just you need to get a bunch of reviewers to agree um, and then see if you can just get a, a an oddball committer to pick it up. When you you've basically um, once you get the reviews, the a, a committer doesn't feel like he's taken as much of a risk. Interesting. The next question would be: Only Corvin has looked at this. There's a couple of other names that I see on a on a subscribers list for these changes. That's Imp and R Grinds and B Cran. Ask oh, yeah. him if he'll ask him directly if he'll commit it. Yeah, which one? 
Uh, Rebecca, yeah. not so much in that department. May as well yeah, reach out to Rod, which is our Grimes. Um, yeah, yeah, Rod's probably a great choice. And okay. don't get me wrong, do you have the Beehive group auto tagged on there? I think I asked this before. I'm having a flashback. Was I think it is. I don't it know. It should be. Oh yeah, group reviewer Beehive. Okay, so I know, of course, John's a busy boy, but I think he's also happy to think, well, if Corvin's dealing with it, then we're good. Um, I would say, hey, write John Baldwin and Rod with like, hey. Corvin thinks that, seems to think this is good. Could you just give a moment to give us a quick look over? Um, I'm not getting much review from anybody. So I have another change for FreeBSD Artstoning, which has nothing to do with Beehive. Um, maybe some of you want to take a look at it and tell me that I'm totally crazy for even trying to do that. Uh, do you have a link? Uh, I don't have a link, but the number is D46559. B four six D four six. Basically, I'm trying to get rid of reboot minus P, which doesn't reboot but power off. Uh, could you repeat the number? Four six five uh, five, five nine. Five five nine. Okay. Oh, powering off reboot. That, that did okay. Here's a link to that. Uh, you're trying to get rid of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of reboot minus p. <laughs> Why? Um, because it hurts me coming from Illumos where I do reboot minus p all the time and it reboots. And if I do that on FreeBSD, it powers off. And if that machine is in a remote location and I can't power it on remotely, that what sucks. does dash p do on reboot? I mean, I just do, I, I don't usually put any flags on reboots. So, right, reboot should be reboot, but no, so, um. So it's not, it doesn't behave the same as Illumos, and is there such a command on Linux, and how does it behave? Um, well, the thing is, on Illumos, this just means uh, reboot physically through the BIOS or UFI ROM or whatever you have, and not use fast reboot, which uh, was a feature that Sun introduced in the late stages of open Solaris development that was supposed to just load a kernel so the kernel would load a new kernel and not go through the bootloader and the, the system firmware. And that worked for a while, and eventually uh, it started to cause problems, so it became a habit of just typing reboot minus P, even though there's a setting to just disable it in the system. Um, of course, I understand that that's completely my problem, but on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to ask the system to reboot, and it powers it off. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. that's one yeah. you're, you're likely... I would expect you to run into resistance too, because that yeah, feels like it, removing something that people may already did. be used to on the other side. <laughs> That's the question. Are they? I mean, usually there's a power off command on FreeBSD, and there's halt minus p. If you actually want to power off. I like how you ran squarely into uh, Warner, who rejected it without reading it. This is a terrible idea, but then it's like, oh, I read it. Um, okay, hold on. So um, I wonder if this is best on a mailing list where it's good to survey how many people rely on the so let's, typical let's reboot be, dash P. Go ahead, John. I, I haven't looked at it, but just to be clear, reboot isn't a standalone utility. It's actually halt, reboot, fast halt, and fast boot. Um, yes. So removing dash P is going to have to be, would have to be specific. Um, it is. And you know, I've <laughs> I've I've come from different systems over over my lifetime, and I'm not afraid to MV reboot to dot reboot and put a reboot script in front of it to check for dash P and yell at me if I if I specify it. Sure, you can do that. That's one way to do it. That's. That, but, that that's uh, that's how I that's how I do my self training. Teach myself <laughs> teach myself not to use options. Yeah. Anyway, this is not breaking halt minus p. This was the criticism that uh, Warner had, and this is just not what the change does. Oh, huh. yeah. <laughs> okay, 
Sorry, sorry for hijacking the beehive call for this. Yeah, no, it's a perfectly on topic because gee, people reboot VMs, and that's a question of uh, state management. Are you on any of the mailing lists? Like, be it uh, uh, maybe yeah. architecture or current, but um, I would say, hey, just mildly controversial proposal regarding re reboot dot p reboot dash p. Do compare it to other operating systems, such as Illumos, Linux, and other OSs of choice. And if you can make a case for it, uh, that makes sense. But what, just, I'm going to play dumb here. What is the whole intent of reboot-power off, I guess? Is that what, what's going on there? That's exactly what it's doing. If, if you run reboot-p on, on FreeBSD... It's just the same at hot minus p, and it'll just power off the system. Yeah, and <coughs> and it behaves differently on Lumos. Yeah, I'm looking at a at a rel eight system. They have a dash p option also to power it off. So why is it a reboot in that case? Huh. That's a question. Yeah, or unless it's one of those utilities that's just alias to all kinds of different things, and it just happens. It's actually, yeah, it's 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 hard linked. Okay. If you look in the file system, you'll see they're they're linked. Okay. To shutdown or? Uh, they're all together. Okay. I'd have I'd have to look at the make scripts to figure out which one went first. Sure. No worries. Okay. Well. So the uh, Linux uh, reboot command, the man page that I could just do that find. Uh, it does mention minus p to power off, but it mentions explicitly that it is for the hard command. <laughs> hmm. So I'm not sure how it would react if you would do that with reboot. Hmm. It would just ignore it, or and I don't have a Linux handy to test it. So maybe, maybe I can find some. Eva, do you have any VPP news? No VPP at the moment. I've been re-imaging hosts. Cool. Yeah, and I've also been getting the honeycomb out of storage for you. Oh, thank you. I so appreciate I that. Right over there. Cool. And, um, yeah, doing some Power 9 stuff soon. That's coming up in somewhere in the next week. Um, but yeah, just uh, doing uh, infrastructure provisioning for the most part. Cool, 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 cool. Just uh, Andrew, yes. Sorry. Just okay. to clarify, the reason I had forgotten the dash P was a thing is because at least on uh, the Illumos that we have installed, the default is to disable fast reboot, apparently. So I just I just checked. Um, that's that's been there for a while. Way, way back in my memory, I remember it being a thing and being a giant pain in the rear. So, yeah. So fast as in don't flush to disk or what? Yeah, I was about to say, I think that's what you're referring to because I've had problems in the past. Shutdown will give you a clean shutdown. Reboot is not guaranteed to clean your file systems. Um, I don't think it does that. What I think, it, if I remember right, and like I said, been half a decade since I used a system with it enabled, but I think what it does is it doesn't go, it goes all the way out of the kernel starts up another kernel and just continues from there. It doesn't drop you all the way. It doesn't actually do a full system reboot. That's precisely what it's doing. And it only works if all the drivers that you're using are prepared to do that. Yeah, it's got, yeah. There were issues yeah. with it. That's why it's not a default anymore. <laughs> Even if you would change that, by this time, there are so many drivers which don't support it properly. So, <laughs> you can enable it, it would still wouldn't work. Really? I, I mean, would have expected the drivers to get better over time supporting yeah, it. That's, that's an aspect that nobody really wants to put a lot of effort in. Because it's disabled mm -hmm. by default, nobody really wants to use it. Everyone got burned by it like 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> I mean, the reality is, at least as far as I'm concerned, it was always kind of a solution in search of a problem. The amount of time it takes to reboot yeah. your server is, 
if you're worried about that, you've got other issues. <laughs> oh, some systems can take a while. They can take a while, but if you're concerned about that, you know, you, you should have your system redundant. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Anyway, anyway, this this feature dates back to like what 2009, 2010, something like that. It goes it it goes back to at least the open Indiana days. Older than that, it's it's really uh, it was introduced when it was still open Solaris. Well, I mean, that would be that's kind of the same period. Well, open Indiana is still around. Huh? Any other ideas, topics, questions? Questions, questions, questions. I guess they are still using that as the name for the for the forked project. Hmm. Oi, oi, oi. But they get their name from Indiana was the original Sun one. Oh really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. That was the that was a fully open sourced version Sun did was Indiana. This was uh, the code name of Open Solaris the distribution. Yeah. Um, which introduced all that fancy new package management and whatever they did. Cool. Anything else at this time? Well, then I say we call it and we all just keep doing the homework we've described. Um, I'll make a note to get you some pass-through goodies because it's like, well, use this firmware and map these other devices to, you know, at least the Intel needed PCI devices are all predictable across their product line, but still. So, Hans, um, okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. We've lost Chris. He's quite good at the slogan. Any takers? Like and subscribe. There we go. Well, thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.